All right, welcome to the next lecture. Let's dive in with the question. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is D, P24. So next up, we're going to discuss, of course, HIV, which is the virus causing AIDS. And AIDS is diagnosed once that CD4 count drops below what? Below 200 cells per millimeter cubed. Now, some of the most important information that you need to know for your exam is what conditions your patients are at an increased risk for, talked about this earlier, when the CD4 count drops below certain thresholds. We'll get to those momentarily, but first, let's take a look at the anatomy of the HIV structure, the HIV molecule, and let's talk about a few important structural pieces and proteins and things that we need to know to be able to answer basic HIV molecule anatomy questions on exam day. So first of all, remember HIV is a diploid genome. And as I mentioned, there's a few important proteins. So first we have A here, GP41. This is a transmembrane glycoprotein and it's acquired when the virus buds from the host cell. Now this is needed for the fusion and entry into other cells. GP120, this is a docking glycoprotein, and this is responsible for attaching to the host CD4 T cell. Now we have C here, P17. P17 is a matrix protein, and P24 is a capsid protein. HIV has reverse transcriptase, which of course synthesizes double-stranded DNA from genomic RNA. This then gets integrated into the host genome. Now, HIV binds CD4 and either CCR5 on macrophages, which is a co-receptor, or CXCR4 on T cells. Remember, people can be either heterozygous or homozygous for a CCR5 mutation. That will either slow the disease or prevent it. Now, if someone is heterozygous for the CCR5 mutation, then what happens is the course of the disease will be slower. Now, if they're homozygous, they're actually immune. So yes, you can be immune to HIV. The P24 AG capsid protein is important in diagnosing HIV because the diagnostic test that we're going to use is the HIV 1-2 ABAB immunoassay. That detects viral P24 capsid proteins as well as IgG antibodies to HIV 1 and 2. Now, if you've done older questions, which is why we always suggest you use the fresh up-to-date questions, you might have thought the Western blot was how we we're going to use this, but this test has higher sensitivity and higher specificity. So keep that in mind. Make sure you always do up-to-date questions. All right, let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you know the right answer. The correct answer here is E. So. Once the CD4 count drops below 500, we are in a position where we start to really worry about our patient and the possible consequences. So at this point, we have a few major concerns. We are concerned for candida albicans, EBV, HHV8, and HPV. So let's do a quick review of each. So candida albicans, talked about this already. You wanna watch for the main symptoms of oral thrush and the presence of scrapable white plaques in the mouth and pseudohyphate on microscopy. EBV. Watch for oral hairy leukoplakia, which was the answer and focus of this question. And you can differentiate this from candida because this plaque is on the lateral tongue and the key here is it's unscrapable. Keep that in mind. HHV8 is responsible for Kaposi sarcoma. And when it comes to Kaposi sarcoma, the biopsy findings will show you lymphocytic inflammation. And then we have HPV. So with HPV, watch for cervical cancer or even anal cancer. Um, especially anal cancer in uh, homosexual men. Okay, keep that in mind. All right, moving on to the next question. As always, hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is B. So the next threshold for concern uh, for us with AIDS patients is when the CD4 count drops below 200 cells per millimeter cube. And our main concern at this point are histoplasma capsulatum, the JC virus, and pneumocystis gyrovecchi. So let's take a look at each one of these so you know what to look out for on exam day. So first, histoplasma capsulatum. This presents with a bunch of nonspecific findings like fever, weight loss, fatigue, dyspnea, cough, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Doesn't, doesn't really give us much. But on microscopy, look for oval yeast cells that are found within the macrophages. Now, the JC virus leads to something known as progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. This is, of course, characterized by neuro findings. So 
uh, coordination difficulties, walking difficulties, visual disturbances, weakness, speaking difficulties, facial drooping, as well as changes in personality. So um, really a lot of neuro findings here. So keep this one in mind. If you are below 200 and you see these findings, I want you to really, really think about the JC virus and PML. Now, neuroimaging with PML will demonstrate cerebral atrophy. Our last one here is pneumocystis gyrovecchi. This, of course, leads to pneumocystis pneumonia, which, if you recall from earlier, this demonstrates ground glass opacities on imaging. All right, let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is E. So once we drop to below 100 cells per millimeter cube, we have a new set of concerns. And since the immune system is extremely weak here, there are many um, more than we had when the CD count, when the CD4 count rather, was higher. So let's talk about those. The biggest things I want you to keep in mind are A, Aspergillus fumigatus, CMV, Cryptococcus neoformans, Cryptosporidium species, EBV, Toxoplasma gondii, um, and we'll also talk about the mycobacterium avium complex, MAC. We worry about MAC more so once a CD4 count drops below 50. Let's talk about all these. Um, if Out of all these, I would say MAC is probably the thing we see popping up the most. Um, but let's talk about all these so at least you're equipped with what you need to know. So Aspergillus fumigatus, we talked about this earlier. Remember, you want to watch for pleuritic chest pain and hemoptysis. And if they tell you uh, what they found on chest imaging, it's going to demonstrate infiltrates or you might find cavitations. Very important to remember those cavitations. CMV. So you want to keep an eye out for the main findings of CMV. And we have a very good mnemonic that we can we can um, keep in mind with respect to the uh, CMV. So the mnemonic is CREEP. This stands for colitis, retinitis, esophagitis, encephalitis, and pneumonitis. CREEP. On endoscopy, watch for the presence of linear ulcers. And on fundoscopy, I want you to watch for what we call cotton wool spots. Now, biopsy is important as well, and this will demonstrate cells with intranuclear inclusion bodies that have a classic owl's eye appearance. Very high yield, okay? Cryptococcus neoformans, this can cause meningitis. Now remember, with cryptococcus, it's got that thick capsular antigen, so we're going to use the India ink stain to identify it. And this is, of course, a yeast. Cryptosporidium, watch for the presence in cryptosporidium of chronic watery diarrhea, as well for the presence of acid fast oocysts in the stool. EBV, EBV can present with B cell lymphomas like CNS lymphoma or NHL. And if there is a CNS lymphoma, always look for those ring enhanced lesions on imaging. Uh, Toxoplasma gondii. Now with this, we're going to see the presence of brain abscesses that can be visualized on MRI, and they're gonna show you multiple ring enhancing lesions. And finally, Mycobacterium avium complex, MAC. We talked about this one before. This presents with a handful of nonspecific symptoms like fever, weight loss, night sweats is unique, as well it can present with focal lymphadenitis. Remember, MAC is most likely when the CD4 count drops below what? Below 50. All right, let's move on. We're going to do a matching exercise. What we're gonna do here is match the organisms to their common features. So what I want you to do is go ahead and hit the pause button. Figure this one out in your books, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. Here are your correct answers. Take a minute, pause the video, and just make sure that you got everything right here. I'm not gonna go over this because we've gone all over these, but what I want you to do is make sure that you can match the important organisms with the important features. All right, let's move on to our next one. Same thing, go ahead and hit that pause button. This time, I want you to match the common cause of watery diarrhea with their correct characteristic. Go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back. All right, so take a minute, make sure you got these all correct. These are super high yield. So all of these matching exercises are super high yield through the entire program. Anytime matching comes up, it means it's very high yield. You need to know that stuff. So go ahead and uh, pause, make sure you got this correct, and then come on back when you want to jump into the next question.
All right, so in this matching exercise, I want you to match the most common cause of pneumonia with the correct age groups. Neonates, children, adult, 18 to 40, and then adults 40 plus. So go ahead and hit that pause button, and then come on back when you want to see the correct answers. Here are your correct answers. Go ahead and hit the pause button. Make sure you got them all right. If you did, beautiful. If not, just make sure you understand where your mistakes were because it's really easy to um, miss a diagnosis on exam day if you are not paying attention to the age group. And often if you don't know what's going on, the age group alone can point you in the right direction and really um, help you answer questions correctly that you might not really know, but you know if it's this age, this is the most likely cause. At least it gives you an educated guess and if you can approach questions you have no 100% solution for, but you can approach them with an educated guess that boosts the percentage chance that you get it right, if you do that throughout your exam, whenever something like this pops up, it will simply just increase your odds of a good score. All right, let's go to the next one. This one's a little bit longer. Hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answers. All right, so here are your correct answers. Go ahead and hit the pause button. Make sure you got them all right. As always, these are just high yield facts you need to make sure you can recognize. Now, you're not going to get a question that says, what's the third leading cause of UTI? But you are going to get UTI questions. You're going to get most common cause. You might get second or third. And if you don't know what those are, then you can't identify the organism and then answer the question that's second or third order or fourth order. Um, so these are really important things you need to know like that. All right, next one. Go ahead and hit the pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. This one's pretty easy. Hopefully you get these right. Okay, so we talked about I believe it was trichomonas vaginitis earlier, but we haven't gone over all these um, bacterial vaginosis, trichomonas, and candida. So let's talk about these real quick. So first, with bacterial vaginosis, remember this is not an inflammatory issue like the other two. And it's characterized by two important signs, a thick white discharge and a fishy odor. Lab findings with the bacterial vaginosis are going to show you clue cells, as well as a pH greater than 4.5 and a positive potassium hydroxide whiff test. And you can treat this with either clindamycin or metronidazole. Now, trichomonas vaginalis, or trichomonas vaginitis rather, is characterized by a strawberry cervix, which we talked about this one earlier, a frothy uh, yellowish green foul smelling discharge as well. So, those are your physical findings. Now, on lab tests, we can look for motile pear shaped trichomonas. And this, just like bacterial vaginosis, has a pH above 4.5. This does require treatment for which we can use metronidazole. Remember, the patient and their sexual partner or partners need to be treated. Otherwise, you're just gonna pass it around again and again. The last one here is candida vulvovaginitis. This is, of course, caused by candida. And like a lot of candida species or candida infections, you're gonna see thick white lesions. And in this particular case, you look for a thick white cottage cheese-like discharge. Now, the labs will show pseudohyphae in a normal pH between four and four and a half. So that's a little bit different from the first two we talked about. And you're gonna treat a candida uh, vulvovaginitis with one of the azole medications. All right, let's move on to our next matching exercise. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, here are your correct answers. Let's quickly review this information because it's it's fairly high yield and I wanna make sure that we go over the important stuff here. So Coxsackie, Coxsackie type A causes hand, foot, and mouth disease, of course. 
This is characterized by the presence of oval-shaped vesicles on the palms and the soles, as well as herpangina, which is characterized by vesicles and ulcers where the oral mucosa. HHV6 causes roseola. This is characterized by asymptomatic rose-colored macules that appear on the body following a few days of a high fever. Now, this can also lead to febrile seizures, so please be wary of that. Measles virus, of course, causes measles. That's characterized by that rash that starts on the head and makes its way downward. Starts up here, moves down here. Remember that this is associated with coplic spots on the buccal mucosa. It's very important. They're not going to say coplic spots, though. They might say little speckles of something or pepper-like speckles. Just remember, those coplic spots are like little pepper speckles on your mucosa. So just they can say it anyway. I want you to be wary of that fact, though. They won't just say coplic spots. Now we have pyro V19. Of course, this is this is going to cause um, fifth disease or erythema infectiosum, and this, of course, is characterized by the classic slap cheek rash on the face. So if someone looks like someone slapped their cheeks really hard. That is pyro B19. Uh, rubella. This the rubella virus causes rubella. This is characterized by the presence of pink macules and papules that start on the head and make their way downward. This is also going to be associated with post-auricular lymphadenopathy. Strep pyogenes is associated with scarlet fever. You can identify a scarlet fever by the presence of flushed cheeks and a circumoral pallor on the face, uh, fever, sore throat, strawberry tongue, and a sandpaper-like rash from the neck to the trunk and extremities is also likely to be seen. And finally, we have the varicella zoster virus. This causes chickenpox. We have a vaccine for this. But if it's not given, a child can experience the presence of a vesicular rash that starts on the trunk and moves to the extremities, gets basically all over the body. It's very, very itchy. Okay, well, let's move on to our next matching exercise. Hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answers. All right, here are your correct answers. Take a minute, pause, make sure you got everything right, and then let's do a quick review of the highly tested SCDs and their most likely presentation. So first, chlamydia. Now this can present with things like urethritis, cervicitis, epididymitis, conjunctivitis, reactive arthritis, and of course, PID. And if PID is left untreated, it can cause what? Infertility. Now, what types of chlamydia are responsible for these findings? Types D through K. Now, I want you to remember that a co-infection with gonorrhea is possible, and the symptoms are fairly similar, but one of the, the um, unique findings of gonorrhea will be that purulent discharge. Of course, gonorrhea is caused by the Neisseria gonorrhea organism. Chancroid is next. This is caused by the Haemophilus ducreae organism, and this is characterized by a painful genital ulcer with exudate, as well as the presence of inguinal adenopathy. Condyloma acuminata is next. This is the cause of genital warts due to two causes, two types of HPV. What two types are those? Six and 11. And I want you to remember that the visualization of coilocytes helps us to confirm this diagnosis. Genital herpes is next. This is caused by HSV2, but possibly HSV1 as well, although less commonly. And of course, HSV herpes is going to be characterized by those painful vesicles and ulcers on the penis, the vulva, and or the cervix. Next up is granuloma inguinal. This is also known as donovanosis. Now this is caused by Klebsiella, and this is characterized by a beefy red ulcer that's painless, but it bleeds easily with minimal contact. Then we have lymphogranuloma venarium. This is caused by chlamydia trachomatis types L1 through L3, and is characterized by painless ulcers on the genitals, in addition though to painful lymphadenopathy. All right, let's move on. We've got a couple more here. Correct answer here is E sulfonamides. Now it's really important that you know which drugs, whether in micro or otherwise, can interfere with the proper development of a child because um, this is such high yield information. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, toxic antimicrobials of the fetus. Now throughout the rest of the course, we'll talk about the teratogens, but right now we're focusing on micro. So first we have aminoglycosides. These can cause autotoxicity. These sulfonamides, what can these cause? Kernicterus. Fluoroquinolones. Remember fluoroquinolones hit the bones. This can cause cartilage damage. Tetracyclines. 
These can lead to what? Very, very high yield information here. They can lead to tooth discoloration, so browning or graying of the teeth, and they can inhibit bone growth. Clarithromycin, this is just as a whole, embryo toxic. Now, ribavirin and griseofulvin are both also teratogenic, and chloramphenicol can cause another very high yield condition, which I see all the time. It causes gray baby syndrome. Okay, and our last, there's three slides here in your books. Um, this is an overview of the micro farm. Now, I'm not gonna go over this because it would take a long time. This is a crash course, and I would just basically be reading everything to you. But I put these in a very organized way to help you organize these drugs. Make sure you're familiar with the drugs, the mechanism of action, which um, you can see here are in, the, are in uh, blue, uh, the uses, and probably most importantly, the adverse effects, all right? So um, go through this, these three here um, and make sure you can recognize on a higher level what most drugs, what classes they belong to. It is really important high yield information. So we have our HIV therapy drugs, anti uh, mycobacteria, antifungals, antivirals, and then of course antibiotics. All right, that is the end of micro. We'll see you in the next topic.